to our Connecting AKU webinar series. This series is especially curated to share AKU's transformative work, research, new initiatives, and uh, finding new opportunities to make the world a better place uh, during this pandemic and before. Today's webinar will look at the pandemic disruption and the opportunity for us to rethink about education, teaching and learning in East Africa in a way that will enable us to think ahead, collaborate and innovate to better the quality of education in the region. Today, we are very privileged to have three distinguished speakers from AKU, um, Dr. Alex Awiti, Dr. Tashmin Hamis, and Dr. Jen Rarier. To moderate this conversation, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Anne Ishui, a lecturer at the University of Nairobi School of Journalism. Today's session will run for 60 minutes. Anne will be moderating a conversation for about uh, 30 minutes with the panelists, and then we will take questions from the audience. Please feel free to ask your question. Um, you can send an email to connecting.webinars at aku.edu. And without taking much time, I wish to welcome on board, Anne, um, over to you. Greetings. Super excited that every one of you has managed to join us today. Indeed, this is an excellent, excellent conversation that we are all about to have. Um, I'm sure all of you have been affected in one way or the other by the COVID pandemic. And indeed, this pandemic has created a watershed moment for the whole world and for East Africa. Today, we want to talk about the pandemic disruption. We're looking at the future of education, teaching and learning in East Africa. As Kevin has mentioned, we have a pool of experts who will help us take this conversation even further and shed light on many issues that have concerned us concerning the impact the pandemic has had on education. Allow me to introduce our pool of experts. To start us off, our first panelist is Dr. Alex Owiti. He's the Vice Provost at the Khan University, East Africa. Dr. Alex Owiti, prior to assuming the role of Vice Provost, he was the founding director of East Africa Institute at the Khan University, which is a regional platform for policy research, performance, and public engagement, which focuses on the consequential drivers of social, economic, environmental, and institutional change. Dr. Alex Owiti is a transdisciplinary scholar whose research intersects agriculture, ecology, education, society, population health policy, and the economy. As one of Kenya's leading public intellectuals, he has written over 650 opinion articles published in leading Kenyan newspapers and international publications, including the International Policy Digest and The Conversation. Welcome, Dr. Awiti. Our second panelist is Professor Tashmin. She is the Vice Provost at the Khan University in charge of quality, teaching, and learning. Dr. Tashmin is the founder of AKU's network of quality teaching and learning. She has served as past president of the East African Quality Assurance Network. This is a network of higher education quality assurance practitioners from 80 universities across the East African community. Our third uh, uh, panelist is Dr. Jane. Dr. Jane is an associate professor, Institute of Educational Development and Director, Network of Quality, Teaching and Learning in Aga Khan University. She is a fellow of the Commonwealth Center for Education at Cambridge University, UK, and a trustee, Children in Freedom Trust, UK. Her specialization is education, particularly in the area of gender, leadership, and faculty development. To all of you, our participants, you'll agree with me. We have a rich wealth of scholars right here. Great insights are about to be shared. 
and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to every one of you and to thank you panelists for making the time to share and drive this conversation forward. To start us off, I would like just to discuss something brief and have Dr. Awiti answer this question. Dr. Awiti, you're Kenyan, and you've been watching our Kenyan news and seeing all that's going on in this country concerning education. Every time we watch the news, uh, teachers have been told to go back to school. Then the next week, it's changed. There seems to be a back and forth in education. Dr. Awiti, tell us, do you think as a country, we have done well in mitigating the learning crisis? To you, Dr. Awiti. Thank you very much. And I, I think uh, uncertainty is the new normal. Uh, making decisions in an environment where you don't have all of the facts that you need, and yet you have to speak to a legion of constituencies who have different expectations, especially all of us as a collective expectations on government, expectations on the education sector. Parents uh, have grown wary of keeping kids at home. Uh, the kids are also very tired of staying at home and watching TV and engaging in partial learning. I think in many ways as a society, uh, we have done well. In some aspects, uh, we have come short. Um, I think in terms of navigating the, the complex variables that we need to understand to enable us to open schools in an orderly and safe way, uh, we haven't done very well on that in terms of evaluating the various pieces of information that we needed. Uh, we're not great at con uh, contact tracing. We're not great at testing. Uh, we don't have what I would call credible access to some of the things that we need to protect ourselves. I think when you go to the public school system, and I've had a chance to speak to, to many teachers, uh, they don't have the resources to make even soap available. Uh, a lot of our schools face uh, all kinds of crises, and especially crises of water and sanitation. If you talk about primary schools, for instance, our, our schoolhouses are woefully inadequate even to support learning under normal times. Uh, class sizes are outsized. There's just too many kids packed in one, in one room, often poorly ventilated, for instance, and just insanitary in many ways. So I think if you look across the spectrum of challenges, uh, we need to socially distance students in the learning environment to about 20 students per, per class. You're talking about class sizes that average uh, maybe 60, uh, 70. How many times are going to split that class? And then how many teachers do you need to bring on stream? So in terms of new investments in infrastructure, new investments in paying for new teachers, uh, any investments in just reorienting teachers to, uh, to teach in the, in, in the new way. So I think while this is a public health crisis, it has created a consequential crisis in education and learning. And, and I think our government, to be honest, has not responded like it should. Uh, the public has not been very helpful too. And we've, we still have a virus that is raging out there. And uh, we're yet to see the worst of this of this crisis. But, so I think on average, we've done very, we, we've done not so well. Uh, there's a lot that we can do, but we'll see in the coming weeks when the minister uh, presides over the opening of uh, in-person learning. And we've got about two weeks to basically understand whether uh, we are over the virus, uh, whether we'll see clusters of spread and, and surges, which will then cause us to dial back, uh, close schools again, or uh, make other decisions that would protect the safety and the health of, of students and teachers. Thank you so much, Dr. Awiti, and very well said. You know, last week I was up country and I couldn't even conduct my classes. I'm a lecturer and unfortunately in the village, we don't have power where I come from. And my son who's a graduating student in campus could not also um, have these classes. So indeed there's a disruption that totally needs to be uh, mitigated. And I'm very glad that AKU is proving to be a thought leader in this space. So let's quickly dwell into the discussion for the day. And I will pose this question to Dr. Jane. 
you know, Dr. Jane, when I read your bio, it came out very clearly. You are our expert in matters education. And I know the teachers right now, after celebrating World Teachers Day, are waiting to hear what you have to say to this. So to Dr. Jane, the pandemic has caused massive disruption to the educational system in Kenya, and of course, East Africa. Um, it has revealed underlying fundamental weaknesses in all sectors, particularly in the education sector. What has been the impact of the pandemic within the education sector, Dr. Jane? Right. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, Anne, and um, hello to everybody. Um, I think uh, one thing, Anne, that I just have to start off by saying is that this pandemic has really made us engage, whether we admit it or not, engage in a sort of introspection about the status of education in this country. Because one of the things that it, it has done, the pandemic has done, is it has actually exposed the issues related to the quality of education that's offered in the education set by in the education sector. And one thing that's come up very clearly is that our education system in the country is very textbook oriented and very focused in being conducted in buildings. So now when the pandemic came and schools shut down, people were lost. Everything literally came to a standstill because that's how we are used to operating. We teach via the textbook and we do it within buildings. So that's one thing that it did. It also made us aware of actually how much work we have to do to show up our IT uh, infrastructure capacity in order to support learning. Whether that learning is to happen in person whether online or even just remotely, etc. Well, the sad thing, and I think um, even though I know Alex has highlighted several things, what I would consider the pitfalls of our education system, but what this pandemic has actually done is it has rolled back the few gains that we had made with regard to enrollment in school, and learning as such. It's postponed national examinations and it will definitely affect transition rates. And we know this because we found that not uh, what the pandemic did to, for us was expose the inequalities that exist within our system. And we thought we had made strides around um, enrollment in school and ensuring equality between girls and boys in our schools. But now we know for sure this has been reversed. We know that our learners are going to be greatly are right now being affected and also will continue to be greatly affected for quite a period to come psychosocially. And these are all matters that will need to be addressed. We're sitting with them, we don't know what to do. And also, um, one of the other things that uh, we've noticed is that the pandemic has also uh, exposed the um, lack of capacity among our teachers and school leaders generally in our institutions. And when I talk about lack of capacity, it's not about discipline knowledge, but it's the other things that go around to making or to improving or to providing the quality education that we want. We found, and I think it's become very evident that our educationists are not particularly skilled when it comes to problem solving, critical thinking, and just to leadership as a whole. And that's why things came to a standstill. Now these are very, very important skills. I've even not even mentioned the basic IT skills that teachers should have to teach, all right? Uh, to teach in other ways, other than if, if they cannot teach in person. And so you find that it is not surprising that as a result, we're in a state that both you and Alex talked about, this yo-yo state where we don't really know if we'd, we, we actually lack the confidence in the directions that are currently being taken by the government about going back to school. 
I think I've uh, largely touched on, in my view, on a number of the issues that I think the pandemic did has uh, taught us or exposed us to. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane. And yes, I will definitely come back to you. Um, Dr. Jane, I'm just wondering because uh, I had this conversation with somebody yesterday and they reminded me of a song we used to sing as children. So I don't know whether your era, you sang that song of Zoom, Zoom, and away we go to school. Oh, did you sing? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I remember right. it very clearly. <laughs> and do you know what's funny is that I think that's wrong. It was supposed to be vroom, vroom, but we say vroom, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, Zoom, Zoom, and now all the students are using Zoom. Uh, it looks like this was uh, determined way before we knew we will need Zoom. So that's on a light note, and I can see uh, Professor Tasmin smiling, so she must have sung the same song. Okay, let me bring in Tasmin to let us know how has AKU been at the forefront of teaching and learning during the pandemic? How have you been at the forefront? Thank you, Anne, thank you. So I think in many ways, uh, the Aga Khan University was ahead of the game. Uh, back in uh, 2011, we actually began a blended learning pilot program. And so our students and our faculty were already familiar with the learning management system. We know universities in Kenya, in East Africa, indeed around the world, have faculty who come to them because of their, as Jane talked about, their discipline expertise. They have a PhD, they have a master's, and so they come to teach students in universities, but they do not necessarily come because they have any teaching qualification. And so uh, back in 2013, at the Aga Khan University established this network of quality teaching and learning that is charged with supporting our faculty to teach better. So um, when the lockdown happened, we actually already were mobilized. We had a preparedness plan in place. Faculty knew who to go to for help uh, as they were now having to use technology more so then just blended, it was now fully online. And in many ways, like the rest of the world, um, it was like building a plane whilst flying it. Uh, you were trying, you were learning as you were doing. Um, and what we saw at uh, AKU is what I think many universities in Kenya and East Africa, and indeed world over also went through is as Jane said, um, if you come into teaching uh, without being properly trained, you end up teaching the way you were taught. And so that meant mirroring what happened in the face-to-face -face classroom. So a lot of lecturing on Zoom, as you said, uh, a lot of um, students going to sleep behind their cameras and, and uh, faculty not knowing uh, how to engage them. And I think initially that, um, that was also the case, but what, we've, what we did is with our team of blended and digital learning, we mobilized resources um, so that uh, people were trained on how to be more interactive on Zoom, how to move to an asynchronous environment, to use Moodle uh, more so, and uh, we listened to the student voice. So students also told us, well, this is all well and good, but I don't have access to internet. You talked about not having access to power. And so what we did do uh, very purposely um, is we gave access, uh, IT access to our faculty and students through the mobile packages, data packages, so that we made sure no student was left alone. And uh, this, this was, I think, how we started and how we were able to cope. Uh, we also, I think, tried one thing that has this pandemic has done is it's brought people together. And uh, that connectedness also happened within faculty. 
So faculty did not just learn from QTL net, they learned more even from their peers. And we see regularly um, faculty coming together, sharing their experiences, learning from each other. So in many ways, I think um, we have seen how, how faculty have driven, um, driven the agenda forward. And there is a real spotlight on teaching like there wasn't before. Um, and I think that is only a good thing uh, to take forward. Okay, very well put. But Dr. Tasmin, I still have a question. And I want to ask you as a parent, not even as somebody in academia. So how do you ensure that the students who's, you know, getting the classes online is getting quality? And they are not just getting quality from the tutor, and that the tutor is teaching with quality, but they are also learning. And I'm asking that because, um, as I said, I have a son in university, so he will sit with his laptop, that he is on WhatsApp because the WhatsApp is on the desktop. He's doing his own thing, but I'm sitting on the other side and he's fooling me as a parent that he's in class. So Dr. Chesmin, I'm asking this on behalf of many parents out there. Give us some assurance that our children are getting quality from the teachers and they're also you know, learning for themselves. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. That's an extremely important question. And I think Alex and Jane have both alluded to the lack of quality. Um, at AKU, and I think also our regulatory bodies like the Commission for University Education, I realizing that actually, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And as faculty were thrown into this environment, they were having, uh, we, we had to help them think through some of the issues of quality that were there for the online environment that are not necessarily there when it comes to to face to face. Although, of course, you always want your student to be engaged. So what we did is we looked at good practice. We developed uh, guidelines for uh, faculty as they transitioned into the online environment. They had to think about things like copyright that they never thought about before. They had to think about engagement that perhaps they should have been thinking more about before. And so we have put in place guidelines for faculty. We've put in place feedback mechanisms from students. So students can tell us, look, we're really bored. We're fed up of hearing your voice. And we see over time how people are using Zoom in more interactive ways, how people are deciding to use Moodle and flip the classroom. Uh, so I think there are ways in which we are uh, looking at quality. And I think we have to remember when we talk about access uh, and Jane touched on the equity issue is it's not just about access to internet. It's also about access to quality. It's also about access to the quality teacher. And uh, with regard to that, I think what happens is that technology is then just the tool. It is still the teacher that is important, the faculty member. And so what we have to do with quality uh, when we look at it in terms of the online environment is to look at what does the digital environment afford to enable that faculty, student or teacher a pupil engagement. So I hope I have allayed your fears a little bit. Yes, thank you so much. And allow me now to loop in uh, Dr. Alex Owiti. You know, the pandemic has caused all of us to be very innovative, has brought about so many opportunities for us to seize. So your question is, where can private enterprise invest or partner with civil society institutions in order to advance education for future generations. Dr. Witi, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, before I get into my question, let me respond in part to the question that you just asked Tashmin, the last one. I think 
at the heart of the crisis in education is the question you posed. Are our children learning? Whether they are under the supervision of teachers who in some cases play the role of parents 24 hours or whether they're learning from a distance. Uh, I think the real question is how do we remodel education to give agency to the learner, to enable learners to be more self-directed, to be able to determine their own learning goals so that we don't have to ask the question, are they learning? Because the teacher then becomes the guide on the side and not the sage on the stage who sets the learning goals and learning priorities. And then we reformulate education uh, around portfolio learning, around project-based learning. So that at the end of the day, the student sees the connection between the knowledge and the potential for real application in the real world. So it, it is the concept of a flipped classroom that Tashmir is talking about. The question is, if you're gonna teach like the last person who taught you, and this is the joke that we made about professors, is that they will go to the classroom, especially when you come from uh, uh, a teaching education background and you go into high school, you will do exactly what your professor was doing. And those guys have a lot of bad habits that we have to shake, to shake away. Uh, so the question really is, how do we start the conversation around teacher support to enable them to transition into this new, in, into this new dynamic, uh, which again, I think in many ways puts more tools in the hands of the teachers, but also liberates the students to then direct their own learning and to become more collaborative and to engage more directly in the community and make their learning more meaningful. Um, so we can come back that, to that at some point, we probably will see questions coming from the, from, from, from the audience. Uh, but to your question to me about opportunities and roles for private sector, for government, for civil society, I think there are many, many opportunities. We're just talking about education reform. So one is around the policy and regulatory environment. What is the flexibility? I think in many ways, the government has to unshackle the professional teachers. Uh, we can't be handed a curriculum to teach which we didn't design. And I really sympathize with my colleagues who teach in high school because they have no stake in the curriculum. It's just given to them and then they have to teach you a test. And they can game the system uh, to the ends of the world because they'll just teach to the test. And they don't care that the students learn anything. What they care about is the grade that is assigned to the name. And in Kenya, we call it the mean grade. So what is your mean grade in that subject cluster? I'm a math teacher. Is my mean grade C? or an A, it doesn't matter whether the students learn or not, but I taught to the test. Uh, I think the other opportunity is also around curriculum design. As I, and as I mentioned, we've got to release the teachers to do that which they're trained to do. In the classroom, they should be able to determine what they teach. This, this kind of godhead authority called KICD that designs the curriculum and hands it down like a tablet uh, from the mountain on high is not working. It makes education irrelevant. You can teach a child in Trukana in Northern Kenya exactly the same way you teach an urban child. It, the, the, education has to speak to the context in which the learner is embedded. And it has to enable the learner to be effective and proficient in navigating life in their own environment. Otherwise, education is meaningless. Uh, there are questions around funding in education. As I say, the, the, the funding gap is huge. Right now we're grappling with how do we pay enough teachers? How do we employ and pay enough teachers to even go into the pandemic response mode? Where are the classrooms, for instance? Where, the, where is the technology? You talked about the last mile. So that whole funding of the education infrastructure is another opportunity where we can see new private public partnerships emerging uh, to support acceleration of uh, making available essential resources, classrooms, laboratory, and essential technology. The other one is about service learning and internship opportunities. I think we've got to come out of this kind of uh, hubris that education only happens when there's a teacher in front of a child or a learner. Education must happen in the community as well. So what about service learning in the community where students and uh, engage with communities in solving real life problems. Because at the end of the day, life is not physics. Life is not chemistry. Life is 
water, it is soil, it is climate, it is land, it is governance. Life is not a subject matter. Life is problems. And to the extent that we hold these kids up in a classroom, we remove them from the reality in which they will be enacting the student outcomes that we, we are so proud of. Uh, so the curriculum is dead if it is not activated in the real world where real problems are solved. Uh, again, the fact that you have a degree in chemistry or you have a degree in urban planning doesn't mean that you're the best teacher in urban planning. So what about professors of practice, involvement of experts in the field? Imagine learning urban planning from the mayor of a city or a practicing urban planner, besides your urban planning professor, who's, who probably for the most part, the last time he worked was as a junior planner in a ministry 40 years ago. And now he's teaching you to go out there and plan in the modern context. So I think we need to break down these barriers. And it goes the same thing to uh, learners in, in, in primary schools. You can't be teaching agriculture in Kirinyaga and these kids are not at the feet of a farmer who is working in the field. That you're teaching them inside a classroom where they're just suffocating and probably getting bored to death. And yet the field is out there. How do you teach agriculture? How do you teach business? Take them to the market where they understand transactions, they understand the exchange of produce and value addition, and then how do you make extract value out of agricultural produces? So I think we need to really blow out this thing uh, open. And I think it speaks to innovation and reinventing education for a dynamic and an unknowable world. I remember many years ago, one of my professors told me that there's a problem with everything that I've learned in the last three years, because my curriculum was a three-year one. And he said that 50% of everything that he's taught me is wrong, can be challenged as we advance the frontiers of education. And he also told me that 50% of what I've learned will be relevant as soon as I leave the guest of the university. So the question is, after three years and all of the money and the effort that I invested, what do I really know? So the question is really lifelong learning, teaching people how to learn to learn and to unlearn and to relearn. So, so the whole idea, we have got away from the hubris and the confines of curriculum, which supposes or assumes in very arrogant ways that they have defined the canons of what needs to be taught. And outside that, everything else is not important. You can imagine how much knowledge there is out there and how much we try to contain chemistry in a little textbook. And we say, now, if you learn this for the next 10 years, five years or four years, you can become a chemist. But yet you look at the universe of, the, of, of knowledge, even curriculum cannot even capture an iota of that. So let's just be real. I think the other opportunity is around feedback. Private sector, civil society, uh, you know, they go out there, we, when we send students out there, they keep saying that our graduates are not fit for business. How do we benefit from that feedback? How do we engage private sector in reimagining curriculum? How do they give us in real time what they perceive of our graduates? And without the universities getting their backs up and saying, yeah, we've given you the best. No, we haven't. If they're complaining, we need to listen. And if our graduates are not successful out in the field, we need to take a look at that. So to the last question, how can we, how can we all work together? How do you design meaningful partnerships which recognize cooperative, uh, comparative advantages of all of these three groups of people, the private sector, the government, civil society, and delineates mutually agreed roles and responsibilities? We're going to sit around the table and have a dialogue uh, around shared values. What is most important for us as a society? And therefore, what are the critical learning outcomes that will then advance those aims and aspirations of our society, whether it is creating the next army of moral leaders, ethical, publicly conscious leaders who will become the next generation that fights the scourge in our country, which is corruption and, 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 and abuse of office. Uh, how do you produce the next generation of ethical politicians, for instance? Can we agree on certain values? And it has to be a collective conversation in society. Uh, and, and government, I think, must create the right environment that encourages innovation and academic freedom to really allow teachers and professors to design curricula that responds to the real needs of their world out there as best as we can, but also understanding that change is the name of the game and uncertainty is, is exactly what the world out there is. So how do we create opportunities for innovation and experimentation in learning so that 
we are also learners. How do you have a university or a, or a, or a school system that is it, it, by itself very rigid and has refused to learn? And then we are purporting that we are educating kids so that they learn. But us as the, 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 the drivers and the mediators of that education and exchange process have refused to learn. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, because I was about to challenge you um, why you're not the CS of this country in education, but I'll spare you on that one because your thoughts were really, really good. But very quickly, allow me to ask Dr. Jane a question. Dr. Jane, there's a common saying that says that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Are teachers the weakest link? If yes, what needs to be done? And as you answer this question, one of our participants is wondering, why are we concentrating on East Africa? Shouldn't the focus be Kenya? So maybe you can you know, touch on that as you share. I think, uh, thank you, Anne. Um, very quickly, let me take the easier one. Why are we focusing on East Africa and not Kenya? I think, uh, Aga Khan University is a regional university operating in three East African countries. So usually when we talk um, about issues, we tend to look at that from the regional perspective. But I think also to a large extent, a number of things that Alex, Tashmin and I have talked about are largely to do with Kenya too. Okay, around the, week, around the, the, the question around the weakest link, I think that our weakest link, and uh, many may not be very happy to hear this with me if they're in this room at the moment, but is the teachers. And I blame this on the preparation of the teachers because Alex has touched on that and Tashmin has said that. You know, in, in our context, a teacher is very central to children's learning. By central, I don't mean that they take everything that they are the people who lead, who, 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 who lead, let me say, who are on the forefront of learning, no. But having a very well-prepared teacher would have helped us a lot during this pandemic. I mean, for me as an educator, one of the things that really troubled me was how everything literally came to a standstill. And, when, and a sort of helplessness, even when you talked to the teachers themselves in the school, they were helpless. And those who did try to provide online, online teaching, mainly came from private schools. But not even, and I want to point out, not all private schools. These were exclusive elite private schools, because not all private schools are able to cope with the demand of this. I feel that we need to put more into developing our teachers because these are the people who hold the fort. If we had very proactive teachers, a lot of things would have gone on happening in the school context with the aim of providing some sort of learning beyond the classroom itself. That stopped. And therefore, uh, I think that a lot of uh, one area where we need to invest and going by what Alex has talked about, the private, part, a private public partnership, I think we need partners who can help the government to actually capacitate teachers in ways that they can deal with the post pandemic or even this pandemic era, because we still have the pandemic on, but be able to teach in ways that every child is able to have access to learning. Not some, but every child. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We have so many questions, but before we get to the question and answer, where do we go from here? So I want to allow the panelists to just give us uh, just a quick response. Where do we go from here? And then we will get into the question and answer. Why don't we begin with Dr. Alex? Where do we go from here? Uh, thanks. Uh, I think where we go from here is let's go back to the basics. What is the essential value of education? And what is the essential elements of enacting an education, an environment that supports learning? Is an environment that 
that empowers the learner to direct their learning. I think what the pandemic has taught us, with, especially with remote learning, for instance, is that the teachers cannot be in charge all the time. And what's gonna happen in the future is that we could remodel the curriculum to basically go back to kind of more problem focused, more project based, more case based, even at a, at, a, at a high school level. Kids can learn through cases. If you ask them to come back home and tell you what their parents do, that's the case. So how do you get the, to stimulate a new curiosity and make education much more fun? Because right now everybody's suffering from burnout. The kids are tired from the regimented curriculum that is directed by the teachers and all the Zoom calls, et cetera. There's no time for them to kind of play. So I think we need to go back to the basics and understand and, and ask the questions around what really is the value of education. Apart from kind of the, uh, the usual notions of instrumentalizing education and saying you, you go to school to get a job, but the essence of education is, is to enable an, an individual to, to live a, a useful and meaningful life in their society. To gaining the skills is a new addition. Uh, it's important to have the skills, but how do you make education fun, animate the process of knowledge acquisition and enable students to be happy and teachers to do their role, which is to guide learners through their journey, but also to create opportunities for personalizing learning and enable us to identify who has learning difficulties, uh, learning disabilities, and get them to learn at their pace, but basically really tailor make the learning process to suit individual learning needs and capabilities. So it's a call to go back to the basics. Okay, thank you for that. 30 seconds, Dr. Tasmin. Okay, so I would just build on what Alex has said. I think we have to learn that you don't teach the curriculum, you teach the child. And I think uh, as we think about that, we, I remember as a student here in primary school in, in Nairobi, the horror of the last day where you were told where you rank, you know, and I would come home and trepidly say I was 16 out of 45 and that wasn't good enough. So I think what we also have to think about is assessment um, for learning, not just assessment of learning. I think Alex alluded to that. And finally, I would say that, as Alex has said, and I think Jane said, that we are learning for an unknown future. So let's capitalize on what has come forward through COVID and that focus on teaching because just because I have taught doesn't mean you have learned. And I think we have to now really invest in our teachers from early childhood right up to higher education, because those are then the change agents that we want for this unknown future. Thank you. Wow, I don't know whether that was an original quote with you, that you do not teach the curriculum, you teach the child. I have a class after this, I'll make sure I remember that. Okay, Dr. Jane, 30 seconds. All right, um, I think um, Tashmina and Alex have touched on um, things that I would like to mention. But what I'd like to also say is that uh, one of the things that COVID has taught us is the role that parents can potentially play in supporting their children. And I think whenever we talk about the community engagement in education, this is an area that we will really need to look at and think very critically about how we can get parents, engage them more so that they can support their children's learning. Even those parents who can barely think about anything beyond their survival for the day. Um, this is something that we will need to, to really look into going forward. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. We have loads of questions from our audience. Allow me to transition to the questions very quickly for the brief moments that we have. The first question, and I will direct this question to Dr. Alex Awiti. Can you speak to the notion of data analytics or lack thereof to make informed decisions regarding strategy, and change management in the education system. And just to elaborate on that, where are we in Kenya or East Africa? What steps do we need to take 
who will move this agenda forward? That's a, you know, deep question. I hope you got it, Dr. Alex. Okay, uh, let me try. Thank you very much. And, and thanks to the person who sent the question. I think, you know, data analytics is almost becoming cliche now. Uh, we kind of throw this word around, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all of that. But I, I think we need to take it seriously if we're to deploy this to solve real problems. Uh, if you think about uh, education, the whole, all of the complaints that we have, think about them as a wicked problem. You know, uh, there are many, many dimensions of the education problem. One is maybe infrastructure. The other one could be teachers. The other one could be resources. The other one could be the parent role. Uh, the other one could be curriculum. So if you think about all of these as constituent elements of the problematic that is education, how do you deal with this as a complex problem? And what, what would be the role of data analytics? So what is the data on curriculum? What is the data on teacher preparedness? What is the data on school infrastructure? What is the data on policy and regulatory environment? What is the data on capitation? Because we talk about all these things as the problems that constitute the, the brokenness of our education system. Every time we have uh, results coming out at the end of the year, we, we apportion blame and sometimes very astutely. But the question is, how do we deploy data analytics to then guide the decision making process and then to create a new strategies to direct education change. So my, my, my question will be, you know, the government sits on a ton of data, okay? The government sits on census data, the government sits on socioeconomic data, the government sits on uh, demographic and health survey data, the government sits on examination outcome data. In this country, you can get a pattern of performance uh, since independence that is geographic. You know, for instance, why is Trukana perpetually underperforming in education and the districts in the semi-arid and, and arid areas? Uh, why is there a correlation between aggregate student grade by school and the distance from an urban center? Why is there a correlation between socioeconomic income and the, and the level of mother's education and early childhood reading capabilities? So we have a ton of data that we can then put through these data analytics and actually then go back to what I talked about, which is tailor-making education that responds to the learner's needs. Because then there you will pick up where the issues are. Uh, somebody did some survey many years ago and said that only eight, that 82% that of students who were attending public universities in Kenya came from parents who were either working in civil service or whose parents were working in the private sector or running businesses. So there's a strong correlation there. And a lot of these parents were working class parents were then working in urban areas or some were teachers in the villages and the kids had early access to education. What do we do with this statistic? Where 82% of education investments in higher education are going, where a majority of the investments is going to a very small fraction of the Kenyan population and we leave so many people behind. So I think there's a huge opportunity for data analytics, but I, that's when I also say that the government needs to play fair. The governments need to create an enabling environment that enables people who are data literate and sophisticated in analytics to then start looking at this data, but then the government must also listen to evidence. What happened to evidence-based government? Okay, very well put. Dr. Tashmin, interesting question here. Why is our government not keen on partnering with AKU to identify and utilize the knowledge gained to implement ICT integration in teaching and learning. Yeah, I'll start off and I'm sure uh, Alex or Jane might want to add. I would not say that they are not keen. <clears throat> I would say that um, what has happened is if you look, look, for example, at the Commission for University Education, they didn't have guidelines ready. Uh, they were definitely in preparation, but they were not ready for this sort of online learning. And of course, we have seen a massification of higher education in Kenya, in Tanzania and Uganda. And uh, there is the whole question of quality that governments have had to deal with. Um, and the mushrooming of, uh, of uh, remote campuses we hear about in the news all the time. And so I would, I would actually turn the question around and I would say that 
in many ways, I think it was, it's not a lack of uh, wanting to partner, but it is the stage at which the, the government was in terms of the huge public universities uh, that we have. However, I see through the pandemic that AKU is being asked by our various regulatory uh, bodies about sharing good practices, which we do regularly. We have something called a virtual brown bag lunch every Wednesday, the EdTech lounges. And I'm very happy to see uh, many of our public universities join those in um, and wanting to learn. And we also learn from them uh, because we, we do have the privilege of relatively smaller classes than they are having to deal with. Um, but we are very much plugged into associations uh, of practitioners, of faculty, of um, teachers, teacher educators. And I think um, the, the, the partnership that Alex was talking about does very much happen also between AKU and, uh, and, and the government. Alex, I don't know if you want to add anything or Jane indeed is a faculty of IED. She might well, want to. I think let's ask the other question because there are loads and loads of questions that yeah. are important and maybe as a wrap up, uh, anyone else can uh, answer. But Dr. Jane, there's a very interesting question here. How different is the post COVID-19 pandemic learner from the pre-COVID-19 pandemic learner. Where should the teachers start from in engaging with the post-COVID-19 learner? Wow. That's a tough one, Anne. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> I think Alex already told us we have to start from the basic. And uh, I also feel that it would be very hard for me to say how different uh, the two learners are because we've not actually seen the learners go to class, but uh, return to class yet. But I, I would like to believe that the COVID situation has provided us with lots of thoughts for those of us who are teachers on how we should approach our teaching in class, in class now moving forward. I think um, the children today have spent a lot of time at home. They will have lots of questions. And that's the curiosity that we should build on and try to move them forward to kind of have the, the skills I was talking about that is usually missing in our learning experiences in our classroom. So I can't really tell you that a pre-COVID learner had this and a post-COVID, I mean, and a post-COVID learner will have this. It really, it will all depend on what we do with them when they come back to school or what we're doing with them for those of us who are teaching, offering online teaching. It's a tough one, but I, that's the best we can do. Okay, if thank you. Pass it on to Alex. <laughs> all right, Alex, in 30 seconds, do you want to add on anything to that question? I uh, just was going to say that the, uh, the post-pandemic learner uh, will be qualitatively different uh, from the pre-pandemic. Uh, I think because in, in, for those who've been exposed, especially in AKU, to more self-directed uh, modes of, of learning where the, the, the professor was a guide, they would be extremely upset if we went, came back and started pontificating at them and, and, and telling them what to do. I think uh, we, we've, we have to continue the flipped classroom model where most of the work is done uh, in the classroom as a problem set and, and not the teacher teaching to the, to the students. And they, they can go and learn the basics uh, during, during their, their own time, but they want to come to class to be meaningfully engaged. So in a lot of our online offerings, we figured out that from the very beginning, that is very boring to do your PowerPoint stuff that you do in in-person in learning because you lose all the students. But if you create opportunities for them to solve problems in in the learning session, you, you get most participation and you excite a lot of engagement. All right, now our time is almost up, but uh, Dr. Tashmin, there's an interesting question here, which I think you will enjoy answering. 
what is being done in learning and education analytics to inform personalized learning? Let me say that again. What is being done in learning and education analytics to inform personalized learning? Yeah, I mean, this is this sort of touches on this whole area of um, artificial intelligence. <laughs> um, I was recently reading that um, the, the, the chess champions of today are not human anymore. And I think um, we have to actually build on this area of um, using uh, data analytics to inform. I think the, the evidence-based uh, question that came earlier to Alex also bridges on this area. And I think, uh, you know, as you were talking about the, the pre-COVID and post-COVID learner, I would actually say that at the end of the day, uh, our younger learners <clears throat> are actually uh, digital natives. And uh, this is the sort of learning that I think is at their fingertips. Those that are struggling are, are the teachers and there who are the digital uh, immigrants. Um, so I think the support is very much at the level of the teacher and, uh, and the, the, the student is, you know, sees themselves in a continuum with technology. Um, so I'm not sure I've quite answered that question I need to think a little bit about it, but um, that would be my initial thoughts. Okay, and I'm really if we're not going in depth to answer all these questions, that AKU will take this conversation further and even engage participants uh, and help them a bit more. Now, the final question is really good. It actually makes me want to be a student here. So maybe I'll register after this. The final question is, what AKU is doing for its students is brilliant. It is a thought leader and it is really thinking about the country and the region. How can we do more? What do you need from us as individuals, corporations, foundations? Wow, that's a hundred million dollar question. Dr. Awiti, this is your moment, go ahead. Thank you very much. So uh, this is like giving me a blank check to write. You know, it's gonna be a trillion dollar check uh, that we'll be sending to the person who asked the question. I think, you know, we talked about private sector, we talked about public sector, uh, we talked about civil society participation. I think what we need now, not just AKU, but just the learning and education community is to reimagine the partnerships that advance uh, better education outcomes. Uh, I think we have fundamental issues, as Jen said, you know, the, the the weakest link is, is, is teaching. Uh, it, is, it, is the, it is the people who run the teaching enterprise, uh, who direct the learning process. Uh, how do we enable our teachers to, to retool? But also how do we put the essential requisite technology in the hands of students? Uh, these are the things that we need, really need to think about. Uh, how do we create that support structure? Uh, Jen talked about the role of community in the child's education. You know, parents writ large. Uh, the question is how do we make an animated education in all kinds of places? That education must not just be limited to the four boring walls of a classroom. That education happens any place, any time. And, and it, it's about the things that you asked about uh, uh, learning and education analytics. How do we make sure that in this technology mediated interface with education, we are able to direct learning to the needs of the child? If you give a child an online examination, an online problem set, you can monitor so many things, how much time they take, you can monitor the resources they're trying to reach out for and find, and all of these things in an analytic uh, learning systems environment, you can then begin to understand where the student had questions. All of these kind of diagnostic things that we do as professors when the students start, when you give them one question to just level set, we can make this much more precise in determining our ability to respond to the learning needs of the, of the students. Uh, so I think the question is, how do you repurpose partnerships, get much more collaborative, cooperative uh, engagement between civil society, private sector, and government? And how do we invest better and deeper in technology to support both teachers 
and the students to then enable that learning that empowers the teachers to, to support the learning process, but also liberates the students to learn at their own pace. Uh, All just right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Tasmin, very quickly, just add on and then we can wrap up. Okay, yeah, I just want to give, uh, add a couple of real examples. Um, uh, we have partnered recently with the Rosie Noor Foundation to actually raise funds for needy students in marginalized areas to get access to internet and laptops. So that's a real example. Um, a Rotary Foundation is another that has supported us in the past and I, I'm sure will also in the future. So I think there, there are those sorts of examples. We also have recently launched the AKU Teachers Academy, and that builds on what Alex was talking about, is where you actually recognize um, excellent teachers, you reward them for membership, but then through a community of uh, connectedness, they support other teachers to be better. So I would say to the good teacher educators out there, your role in mentoring is also very, very critical in this arena. We know teachers learn best from their peers. All right, thank you, thank you so, so much. To all our participants, you will agree this has been a very, very informative time. I wish we had more time. We would have really dwelled into all the questions and all the concerns that everybody has concerning the disruption in the education sector. My one challenge to AKU and to all the participants, let us take individual responsibility and leave no one behind. Let's make sure there's equity and inclusiveness in our villages, in our homes, and around us. Once again, I want to appreciate our panelists and I appreciate all the participants. Thank you so much for everyone who asked a question. I'm sure AKU will look for another avenue in answering your questions. Thank you so much for being a part of us today. I really hope you've all had a great time and a very informative time. Thank you for joining us. And once again, it's bye-bye from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.